Welcome, everyone. I am Pam Caldwell, and this is my colleague, Nidhi Tare. Uh, and we both work on the infrastructure team uh, for Adobe Sign. And we're here to tell you our journey to a multi-cloud de deployment to AWS and Azure. Adobe Sign is a SaaS-based service. It is part of Adobe's document cloud. In describing our journey, there will be some common themes that we will iterate over and over again. The highlighting of these lessons along the way in the tools and processes that uh, brought us success. Some things that we will highlight. Everything, automate everything. Uh, you'll see that we've uh, built up the entire stack from scratch over and over again. Abstraction. Make it easy for everybody to use. All sorts of contributors within the development environment and use common components. Don't reinvent the wheel when there's something already out there. And finally, but most important, is the culture involved. Um, if you don't have a good culture, then any other technical things that you have in place will fall flat on their face. So to give you the history of where we started from, EchoSign was acquired uh, by Adobe in 2011. At that time, each day, thousands of documents were sent through the ISP in a single data center. When the hard disks in a rack in the data center ran out of space, the site went down, and not in a very pretty way. The process was continually monitored and updated. We had to provision racks and disks. There was even a site outage because of a human being stepped and tripped over a wire. It really did happen, how far we have come. Code updates were pushed out to prod through a shell script that got into Bastion, and then another shell script pushed it out to the app servers, and they had to recycle the app servers. Of course, the site was not servicing any requests. We had to do this at close to midnight. It wasn't fun diagnosing issues at 3 a.m. I don't know about you, I start falling asleep at 10. Uh, this was the state of web development back then, for those of you that were in it. Uh, uptime was an obscure concept that support and sales barked about it, but there was no way we could do it. Basically, it was kept together with bubble gum and chicken wire. So, in 2015, 2013, we took our first steps into automation. Hypervisor from VMware was purchased to create VMs on virtual hosts. And Chef was chosen to configure the host on the individual VMs themselves. We started using Jenkins, yay, to deploy the built RPMs onto the Chef hosts. Testers now had a regular cadence to expect the changes. Cool, they knew when things would get updated. This important step reduced human errors, ensured consistency between the environments, and allowed security patches to be applied in a uniform and universal way. No regression tests were yet run. And in the end, we were still putting code on bare metal hosts in a rack with a human being. So again, a step in the right direction and read it representative of what was going on at the time. In 2015, AWS was getting some traction in the industry. It had a better uptime than the ISP. Disk space could be easily spun up on demand. A cost analysis was done, and it would be even cheaper to run a site in AWS than it was in our ISP. And wait for it, in AWS, we could, there was the possibility of us automating everything. Database, disk storage, everything. At this point, we had experience with Chef and recipes. We knew how to do things better this time. The existing Chef recipes were based as a starting point for the new world, but putting VMs on a host just didn't make sense in AWS as their containers and cloud formation templates. These initial templates were static as this was the easiest way for us to get there. We could just simply configure a particular property the way we wanted it to do and upload it and recreate in AWS, and that made it the quickest thing for that for at that point in time. 
However, that meant that the, pe the people that could change these recipes were a limited group of people. Uh, everything was static, troposphere, the Python library where many of us are familiar with, and its dynamically created templates were still in its infancy. We could not consider it. Because of these factors, we want, we had, it was a limited set of people. We wanted to expand the set of people that could help with the build out. There were, we had lots of engineers that knew a lot about CentOS and AppServes. They just didn't know AWS. To abstract this out, we created an internal tool and we named it Stack Builder. A single CentOS image or AMI was used as a base for these. And from the single image or all sorts of chef recipes are run on top of it. And from there, we could build many different kinds of hosts. Automated validation and health check was also starting to happen. Heartbeats ran in the post build. If a test failed here, the build failed. This indicated that basic workflows were not functioning. So we had braced automation. Even our chef and Jenkins servers are built from scratch. Okay, to create a stack instance in AWS, the stack of temp files were created for each of our environments, dev, stage, and prod. If an environment needed to be updated, the templates and cells, as I mentioned, had to be modified. This first version of our tool stack builder uploaded the templates to an S3 container. There, we used the AWS stack instance to create the, to create the instances. The role-based chef recipes were run and we had running hosts. Today, the individual environment stacks are created in the order in which they're required, but initially, this was not the case. The AMI, then the security groups were created, but they themselves did not have any referential dependencies. And they were created sequentially, as were the entire set of hosts. Build times were glacial at close to three hours. Parallelizing and putting together a dependency order cut down this time tremendously. And we have, we're down under less than an hour. As we found out, the build order mattered. Multiple engineers were adding different kinds of hosts. The instance construction would fail if the dependent piece was not available. To solve this, we introduced a dependency tree that would force the uh, creation of all these dependencies in the order in which they were needed. A bastion was needed before an app server can be started up, of course. And in the end of this, the final migration off of our ISP and bare metal was complete. We were all very happy. I credit my manager at the time for this completion to ensure that all the steps were covered and that all our components had no squishy parts. 2016. Are we on six or seven? We are on six and seven. Uh, in 2016, a request was made for a separate data center to support customers in Europe, soon after data centers across the globe. With EU laws coming, it was critical that we were compliant with any local laws and data sovereignty regulations. What contracts get signed in the Germany data center had to stay in the Germany data center. Our stack builder tool that has created data centers in our North America data center and De De Dev Station Prod could now be expanded to create senators, data centers across the globe. Troposphere and cloud formation template generation were now becoming mature, so this was an option for us. And Stack Builder was updated to use it. The dynamically created templates were uploaded, again, to an S3 container for down use downstream with the Stack Instance creation and Bodo was from AWS was finalized in the configuration. Once it's created and fully configured in AWS, the role-based chef recipes, again, can be run as they had been before. Commit a change, execute a build, and voila, your environment spanning the globe. Our ability to configure, stand up, and deploy multiple data centers ensure we would be compliant with any EU laws. Early on, we made a critical decision and we decided that rebuilding the database would be included in our build process. 
If a new or existing stack is built, the entire stack is replicated. With this, we can run regression tests built in any environment and we have complete confidence that the test results will be the same in all of the environments. Because of this, we were able to take several disruptive code changes on separate branches, do the work, run the regression test, and when they were on par with our master branch, we knew we had complete confidence that it would be safe to merge in and we could move it out. In the end, this test data is pristine. If data is kept during the development process, I don't know if any of you have encountered this before, during the development process, your, there are bugs introduced and odd data could get into your database and there could be bugs pat particular to this that would never seen, you'd never see out in the real world. So if, there, if we see a bug in the code, we know it's a real bug, it's not a fake bug. I have a colleague who calls these special or snowflake conditions for special case scenarios. This has instilled a culture of getting to clean builds and global expectations in our team. Our team spans the globe in every single time zone around there. That if a build breakage happens, we know it needs attention immediately. Management's also aware of this, so they have confidence when they are the ones that say, click, we're gonna deploy to prod, they know it's gonna work. Because of the insistence early on of the database rebuilds, a ripple effect of trust in our system has evolved, and this is huge. Real building stacks from scratch, we call it scorched earth, enables QE also to test with confidence. And the following questions can be validated. We need to know how many documents can be sent in our system at any point in time. What's, how many callbacks can we handle at any point in time? We have QE performance engineers that create their own stacks in their own environment simply by committing a stack builder configuration file. Their instance counts, the types are configured in that file. They change a value in the file, they run a Jenkins job, and voila, with no help from us, they have stood up a data center with 50 or 100 app servers. Outside of snarky comments in the Slack room about getting coffee, our QE engineers are self-sufficient. That's huge too. We must be assured that the deploys have the same performance as the prior to currently code out in prod, and this is the only way that we're able to do this. If we have ability for targeted performance environments, we can validate our site's performance. There is an expectation in the industry that Adobe Sign will be up 24-7 with 4.9's compliance. We and our practices have helped us achieve this. Now, here we are, we're in AWS, we're deploying code regularly, we're very happy, we're masters of our domain, we know it. And a curveball comes our way. Adobe has announced a new partnership with Microsoft that has committed us to getting on Azure. This partnership was constructed from a business commitment to support our customers. So now that Adobe Azure was added, how are we gonna support it? Microsoft is committed to the world that AWS is ready for time, prime time. To ensure this, Microsoft is committed to supporting us. We have de dedicated resources at our disposal. We have weekly status meetings with them. We are a bellwether site for the capabilities on Azure. If they, Microsoft, provided us what we needed, you and their other customers would benefit. We went back to the tool that have allowed us to get us to programmatically build AWS. Stack Builder was constructed, abstracted, with clean access from Jenkins and the command line. With this, we're able to construct a separate but consistent support for Azure with the same tooling, rigorous, structure, foresight early on, was making our lives a teeny bit easier. 
We had to support Stack Builder in the current toolings interface. Our engineers still had to run their tests and builds. We also had to support current AWS stacks as customers still needed updates as we were doing this. To do this, we needed to be able to support and deploy either AWS. So in the top level parsing ah, of the data spinner specific files, we introduced an is Azure flag that specified the configuration. From this, we have a single data point within our tool to reference is Azure or uh, AWS. This flag, it's primarily built, used within Stack Builder. It's also accessible within our chef recipes. Uh, we recently had to adapt our database backup strips because the mounting mechanism is different in both clouds. And now AWS is fully supporting Troposphere, CloudFormation templates are created on the fly, and Azure comes along and it's static ARM templates and no Troposphere available. So we're sort of going back to square one where we were a couple of years ago. We came up with a list of about 30 items that were missing from Azure and were needed for Sign to run at the time. We are working with Microsoft to make them publicly available and we've had success from them to get new tags added to the system, an NTP server support, and private DNS. We did not use a publicly available tool like, uh, what is it, it's not CloudFormation, it's, um, never mind. <laughs> the, uh, there are um, Terraform, thank you. Terraform out there, uh, we, we're using features hot off the presses. Uh, we, we couldn't rely on support from Terraform for us to use these. Uh, I've included here on the right-hand side the decision tree to show the AWS and Azure workflow points. You can see that reading the config file and the is Azure decision point and the cloud-specific code, this is fully encapsulated within Stack Builder. The Stack Builder configuration here, you get to see a nice uh, visual of the flow going through. Uh, in the first part, the decision tree is there, do I build AWS or Azure? And depending upon which is selected, uh, the Azure VNets constructed with a virtual machine is created from the same common image. The same CentOS image that we created before is also used within e Azure also. Um, and once the virtual machine is ready, the role-based chef recipes are run exactly as they had been in AWS. We ensured that Stack Builder configurations created in AWS would also be created in Azure. So if we have a messaging server in AWS, the same exact messaging server will be built in Azure in the same manner. And something else that's kind of helped us along the way, uh, we use a fair amount of AW, uh, open source tools. So you'll see you know, MySQL, Memcached, uh, AMQ, with, uh, this has made our life a little bit easier. In addition to open source tools, we're also using publicly available chef recipes as our baseline for creating our servers. Um, outside of renting time from Microsoft or Amazon, the fixed cost to entry here to get multi-cloud deployment is minimal. And when needed, we did use of course, cloud-specific services. I mean, you have to have a EC2 uh, or a virtual machine. That's just in it. But here again, you know, it's one decision tree creating either or of the features. We've tried to minimize this as much as possible, but when needed, we did use it. And I'm passing it on to my colleague. Thanks, Pam. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, how's everyone doing? Okay, okay. awesome. Um, so my name is Nidhi. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Adobe focusing on deploying sign applications in Azure. So now that you've heard our story of how we got into a multi-cloud deployment scenario, I wanted to show you where we are today. So this is where we are. We have two public clouds spanning across four different continents and with 11 data centers, 
with approximately 50 services per data center. Getting to this point for Adobe Sign has taken us uh, a lot of work, and we have evolved uh, our engineering practices. We have adopted DevOps model, and we have matured over the years. And some of the key areas that has helped us move in our journey are infrastructure as a code, continuous build and deploy, uh, and information and reporting. So let's look at uh, some of the tools that we use in uh, Sign for multi-cloud, and also some of the practices that we follow uh, for our journey. OK, so in order to reliably move applications from dev to production, you need the right tooling. In other words, a tool that helps developers and operators release software changes with confidence. So at Sign, we have developed several in-house tools that let us do all these deployments. And we're going to look at that in the next few slides. Stack Builder, uh, I believe Pam has already mentioned Stack Builder, but I'm not going to go into all those details. We'll just give you a really high level overview of what we do with Stack Builder. It's a single uh, tool, which is Python based, and it's a command line tool. Uh, it, it's built on top of open source technologies such as Troposphere uh, and Bodo3 for AWS, and we use several Azure management SDKs for deploying Azure stacks. Uh, like any other tool, it has some features. Uh, it is developer friendly. Let's you interact with the tool with the command line interface. It can be configured. It's configuration driven. It's extensible. It can evolve with the company. Uh, it's useful. It provides diagnostic information for you to look for errors. Uh, it's version control. It provides audit trail of code changes. It can be automated using Jenkins and other tools. And the most important one, it's repeatable. No many times, no matter how many times you create the stacks, they'll all be the same. So let's look at Stack Builder in a few, some more details. The command line tool that we have for Stack Builder abstracts the deployment operations for both, for both AWS and Azure. So like any other command line tool, it has certain flags or switches. Uh, there's an operation switch which tells whether you're creating or deleting the stack. There's an environment switch, which tells you which environment you're launching the stacks in. And finally, the most important one, the data center switch. It tells Stack Builder to launch the stacks in an Azure cloud within a data center. The point to note here is by adding a simple switch for data center, it's much easy for anyone to create exactly identical stacks anywhere in the world. And this is a really useful example of abstraction that Stack Builder provides. The tool has several utilities and several flags, which lets you do cloud-specific operations, such as is, it, is AWS and is Azure. So, so let's look at some more design principles uh, that we use in Stack Builder today. Uh, in order to deploy multi-cloud, we realize that it's really important to have distinct components with respect to cloud operations. So, what does this mean? So one way to think about it is have a base component or a base class in Python, which has standard operations for creating stacks, and have a cloud-specific component or a subclass inheriting some of the properties of the main class and overriding cloud-specific operations for the main class. So we are following an uh, inheritance model in our tooling for multi-cloud uh, operations. So keeping these principles in mind, we created these components, the operation functions, which creates the stack operation ma uh, operations. Then there is a stack helper utility for uh, creating the templates. And then there is a cloud helper utility for uploading the templates to the storage, which is S3 bucket in case of AWS and a blob storage in case of Azure. And finally, there are some cloud helper utilities for generating the stacks itself. So these are like the four pillars of Stack Builder that we use currently. So abstraction of cloud operation is the way to go. This allows easy extension of the tool. So let's say if tomorrow there's a new cloud in the, thrown in the mix, all we have to do is extend up upon these common functionalities. OK, so the components that you saw earlier tell us how to build a stack in a cloud. In order to know what to build, you need to provide some information to the tool itself. And that comes from configuration. 
The configuration is uh, a set of predefined file uh, settings that allows us to reliably and repeatedly build infrastructure in any environment at any time. There are two types of configuration, the environment specific and the application specific. So the environments ones uh, are the key value settings which are checked into the source code. And here's on the right, you will see a abstraction diagram for the configuration for multi-cloud. At the base is the general config, which has the standard settings, which is overridden by a second level of abstraction for the cloud level settings. For example, if you have Azure settings specifics, those ones go into the, those settings. And then the third level of abstraction is the environment settings, which overrides the cloud level settings with the environment specific settings, which in this case is a preview environment for Azure. And finally, there is the data center settings uh, abstraction, which generates the configuration you need to deploy in a cloud within a data center. So abstracting these configuration has really helped us uh, build the tool and extend it. And as a rule of thumb, always have consistent configuration across both the clouds. This helps a lot with the scale and minimizing any confusions. Let's look at the second piece of configuration, which is the, the dependency tree. A dependency tree defines the order of execution on the stacks that are deployed. Um, so how does this happen? A dependency tree tells the stack, which is a group of tiers, in which order to execute or run the stacks. The starting node on the left is the group node, which is base in it in this case. And the rest of the nodes on the right or the far end represent the independent nodes or the resources which are constructed as part of the base in it. And, these, and this tree is pretty much similar for both AWS and Azure. The thing to note here is once we have the prerequisites built out, which is on the left side, we can just fan out and build the rest of the dependencies in a massive parallel action. And this is the key to faster deploys. For example, once the database is built out, the database workers can be fanned out and built in a massive parallel action. The stacks are created from left to right, top to bottom, and destroyed from, destroyed from right to left, bottom to up. Now, so the same lesson applies here, is keep the configuration consistent across both the clouds. Okay, so here's a summary uh, of how a tier is deployed in multi-cloud using Stack Builder. It uses abstraction for cloud operations using the data center option in the command line. It uses cloud conditional methods such as is AWS and is Azure. Uh, it uses cloud specific components and utilities and classes uh, and uses uh, inheritance in the tooling. And finally, the most important one, keeping the tooling consistent for both the clouds. Okay. Uh, let's look at one more tool we use at Sign which is Chef. So when we embarked on our multi-cloud journey, uh, having to maintain 15 plus flavors for images, for Linux and Windows, and for AWS and Azure was just a nightmare. So we decided to punt on that approach and instead a collective decision was made to use generic images. So create generic image and use Chef to install particulars. So as most of you know, Chef is a configuration management and automation tool that, we, that is open source. So this approach has proved to be extreme, a time-saving and an efficient way of automating multi-cloud for infrastructure as a code. So this, is, this has been a really useful approach for us. So how is a Chef run? Well, Stack Builder bootstraps the VMs, the, which has Chef agents and also provides all the necessary juice to run Chef recipes. The Chef recipe themselves come from the Chef server, which is our repository for 90 plus Chef cookbooks built on top of open source Chef cookbooks. And some of these cookbooks have cloud conditional operations. For example, the time sinks uses, uh, that, that uses for NTP. In case of Azure, we use a third party provider for NTP. While in case of AWS, we use the cloud native NTP sync service. So the point to note here is you can have a chef recipes and have different cloud ways to do uh, the same in cloud operations. On the right is a dependency tree for chef recipes. So when you're installing an app server, it will download several chef recipes and they will all run in this order, which is on the right. 
Okay, uh, let's come to the interesting piece for this conference, which is bill pipelines. Um, so about 100 plus sign engineers are checking in code every hour, every, and they, they are checking in infrastructure and uh, application code. So in order to provide continuous integration and functional testing, we stood up dedicated environments, which are multi-cloud, and which are used for testing applications and infrastructure code changes. So here's a snapshot on the left uh, for our CI CD build pipelines for application and infrastructure code. Uh, the, on the top, uh, the bottom right is the validate infrastructure, is where we verify the infrastructure code changes for AWS and Azure using the last build infrastructure artifacts and using the last certified application artifacts. The one on the left is for validating application bits, and that uses last built application artifacts and the last certified infrastructure artifacts. And finally, we have the release build pipeline, which, which, is, where we are running, which, which is where we are running the regressions. And that, lets, and that uses certified application artifacts from the VA and certified and infrastructure artifacts from the VI to build out complete stacks in AWS and Azure. If a release pipeline is green, the code can be considered for ship it. So most of our engineering time is spent in verifying our application and infrastructure code changes through these pipelines and also stabilizing these. Uh, this is why taking ownership and addressing the failures quickly is a key for our overall success. Let's look at that in more details in the next slide. So the pipelines that you saw earlier are multi-step. They are fully automated. They are all uh, bootstrapped from code. And it's complex. So in order to react to failures quickly, you need the right information and reporting. And that's something that every engineer, uh, developer, and an operations team can do. In other words, you need to know which step failed, where it failed, and why it failed. And this is exactly the job graph on the right helps you, uh, helps any sign engineer figure out the errors when they happen in the pipelines. Uh, there are, there's a failure message, if you can look at the, the block, uh, which tells that the stack builder deploy operation failed. And if you look at some more details, it, it says that it failed on Azure cloud, and there's a data center within Azure where it failed. So now you want to look at why it failed, and to do that, you would click on one of these live links and you, you look at the stack builder errors uh, as part of the troubleshooting. Both Slack and email are used to notify bill failures. Every email that goes out includes the failure logs and bill of materials that are used by application infrastructure artifacts. And finally, the email is sent out to the people or the individuals who have checked in the code last so they can react to the failures quickly and fix it. So this is a really useful automation that we have built in sign uh, from ground up. It has taken us a couple of years to get this up and running, and we use it every day. We found, find it immensely helpful to troubleshoot issues, and the lessons that we've learned from this one is to bubble up the error detection upstream to catch and react to failures quickly. Okay, so let's go to the final steps uh, for demo. Uh, we are gonna talk about releases. To coordinate a release across 20 plus teams, each rolling out new features and bug fixes is chaotic. We've all been there. Although our experiences say that you can, it can be managed as long as you can automate it. So I'm gonna show you how we are automating our release processes in sign. Knowing your artifacts is a fundamental idea behind any release activity. You need to know exactly which application and infrastructure artifacts are present in your production environment at any time, and which ones are ready to go next. This is why we created release candidates. A release candidate compiles a list of artifacts, such as Tag Builder version, Chef Cookbook versions, and application RPMs that will be deployed to production eventually. The goal is to get a good set of values that have been thoroughly tested through preview performance and staging environments. An RC or a release candidate is a single source of truth. When we are ready to roll out a new sign release, a 
and RC is promoted to a, from a staging environment to a production environment where it's used to deploy stacks in all the data centers across the globe using our worldwide deployments. We have developed several automation tools that allow operators to generate, compare, promote, and release, and publish these uh, release candidates. Unfortunately, I won't be going into all those details, but just wanted to give, give you a high-level idea of how the releases are being done here. Uh, another important thing to note is the release candidates are cloud and data center agnostic. So when we are ready to cut a release, the release candidate is rolled out across the globe for all the data centers, for all the clouds. So extremely important to keep a good audit trail of your artifacts, and knowing your artifacts is the key for reliable and repeatable deployments. Okay. So believe it or not, you can deploy to multi-cloud. It is a reality. And we have four nines of uptime with it. So to reiterate some of the constant, uh, concepts we presented here, you've heard this over and over in this conference, of course, too. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this has been a period of at least three to six years. There have been 10 to 20 engineers that have been working on this full time. Uh, we condensed it and made it high level in a 30 minute talk here. There was a, there's a lot of complexity involved, but we focused on the concepts that we believe gave us the success to get here. So if you keep these in mind, you can get there also. Uh, automate everything, ground up, your chef server, your Jenkins server, your databases, over and over again. You should be able to hit a button and know that a stack's gonna get stood up somewhere. Uh, be able to reference which bits and parts are in your stack so you know what is deployed when and where. So if you see that something's going wrong, you can identify where it might be going wrong. So. With respect, to, with respect to the tooling, uh, create a single tool for deploying a multi-cloud instead of having a couple different tools. The, the reason why we use a single tool is it leverages abstraction and all the code is contained in one repository. It's easy to manage, it's easy to maintain and easy for anyone to get onboarded with. And have consistent configuration and order of operation because configuration is the king. So keep it consistent as far as possible. Um, take ownership and address the failures quickly and invest in good error and reporting in your build systems. Make sure the error failures and detection is bubbled up upstream, it provides enough information, diagnostic information for anyone to react to it. Uh, and then finally, in system engineering, there's a saying that there is no finish line when it comes to reliability and availability. Mm -hmm. So our efforts will change and will continue yep, to involve. Continually on. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, first one. Correct, for two things I mentioned, it was in its infancy and we were working with, we are working with Microsoft and they provide us capabilities we need immediately. We can't wait for Terraform to support them. Yep. Are you talking about the build pipelines, like how we test our code using the build pipelines? Yeah. Should I give a quick synopsis of the VAVI? So we have two stacks in our pipeline. The VI is for it, all the infrastructure code is tested and validated with that. All our QE tests are run there. So we know, oh, the QE test failed. It's because some, some infrastructure code, a recipe has gone south. Mm -hmm. And we also have a separate pipeline for validate application. And that is our code logic. And so if some workflow isn't working with them that would service our users, that would fail. Once both of those parallel pipelines pass, they get merged and then that gets deployed to what we call preview, but it's commonly known as dev, dev stage and prod. So then yeah. it gets to dev and all, all our regressions get run there. I think your question was also how often it's run, is that right? Yeah, for example, uh, the developers here are mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, you can... Yeah, so so one thing is the once the PRs are merged, it's only when it's only then we can uh, deploy to a preview environment. And we also have another testing dev environment where you could actually test your PRs. So you could stand up stacks using Jenkins, and that that way also you can do it. And do you want to talk about the data piece? Yeah, a little bit. So each um, builds to the dev happen on a regular cycle of every forty five minutes, every mm -hmm. hour. So if you they are triggered by changes, so on the weekend you won't see many. Mm -hmm. But if you check in something and somebody checks in something also in close proximity, um, it will, there, in the pre-step there's also, um, when you check something in before it even gets in there, there, there's a, we call a greenie build. It runs some basic unit tests on a container. Uh, so if there are any data, really structural data configuration problems, it will fail that before it even gets to the Jenkins pipeline and gets to the AWS stack because it's running in a tiny little container. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is really the full stack every time. Do you need a wedding and a full feature development or you stick with the other one? Uh, we definitely have that in play. That's, that's, that's ongoing. We just didn't mention it. Yeah. yeah the, we that's part of that. our production releases. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, we stand it up in production. We stand it up ahead of time. Tests were run even before customer yeah. see see the actual site. Once the tests are complete, then the swap happens. Like, uh, we have uh, it, it's uh, yeah, we definitely have a feature a feature flipper type of thing. So yeah, yeah that's in place also definitely. You had a question. Yes. At the end of the month, in, let's say for our use case, they have the same utilization, right? At the end of the month, when you get the bill, which one is better? Oh, good question. <laughs> I am not. It depends I, on what the prices are. <laughs> well, I, I, we are trying, because of our um, partnership, partnership with, Microsoft. with Microsoft, we are moving things to AW, to, to Azure. Azure. Uh, I suspect there might be some pricing advantages there, too. I'm not <laughs> privy to that, but. <laughs> Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.